Can you imagine creating a picking pattern on the acoustic guitar that changed the face of it forever? It seems pretty monumental, right? Well, it is. In fact, today you're gonna to learn about five artists who created picking patterns that changed the way we play and approach the acoustic guitar. Yes, we're about to look at five artists that literally changed the way the acoustic guitar was played. So let's go ahead and just dive right into that list of five picking patterns that changed the acoustic guitar forever. The very first one I have is called the Carter Scratch. Now this is most commonly associated with Maybelle Carter of the Carter family. And I have to say, it didn't originate with her. It actually originated with Leslie Riddle. Leslie Riddle played with and around the Carter family for quite some time. In fact, I do believe they did gigs or shows together, and I think they either lived in the same town or neighboring towns. Nonetheless, he actually taught Maybell Carter the style, and the style eventually got the name the Carter Scratch. It also goes by a couple of other names, uh, the Carter Lick, the Church Lick, or the Thumb Brush Technique. But nonetheless, the technique is essentially playing the melody of the song Song with your thumb while the index, middle, and literally the rest of the picking uh, hand brushes the strings to support it rhythmically. Now a great example of this is Maybell Carter playing Wildwood Flower on the Flat and Scrub show. And I want you to look that up. In fact, if you go to acousticlife.tv forward slash AT147, you'll be able to see that show. But because of copyright reasons, I can't show it to you right now, but I found something better. Courtney Marie Andrews teamed up with NPR to create this wonderful video on the Carter style, the, the Carter scratch, if you will. And she goes through and teaches it step by step. Now here's a little segment of the video where she's actually putting all the pieces together so you can see the Carter scratch in its full glory. Now the next style we're gonna look at, I believe stems from the Carter Scratch and it is called Travis Picking. Most uh, commonly associated with Merle Travis. In fact, it's really kind of the, the style in and, of, in and of itself is an alternating thumb technique to drive the bass while a syncopated, syncopated melody gets played on the higher strings with your index and middle finger. But it's got a little bit of a story as well. Merle Travis didn't necessarily create the style of picking he learned it. Here's the story behind it. He often referred to this style of playing as thumb picking because the only pick he used when playing was a banjo thumb pick. Also, it's called Muhlenberg picking after his native Muhlenberg County, Kentucky, where he learned this approach to playing from Mose Rager and Ike Everly. And what I what I've found with a lot of these styles is it's really an evolution of style. And then one artist really kind of brought it to the mainstream. In this case, it's Merle Travis. And speaking of mainstream, let's go ahead and listen to him playing this very style during the song, which is very mainstream, Smoke, Smoke, Smoke. I ain't dead yet. But nicotine slaves are all the same at a petting party or a poker game. Everything got to stop while they have a cigarette. Smoke, smoke, smoke that cigarette. Puff, 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 and if you smoke yourself to death, tell St. Peter at the Golden Gate, you hate to make him wait, but you've got to have another cigarette. <laughs> I better leave that to Chet. Now in that particular segment, he, he says, I think I'll leave that part to Chet. And I think it's a, a really cool kind of a, a tip of the hat to Chet Atkins, who definitely furthered the Travis picking style, but also shows that the style continues to evolve. I mean, uh, Merle Travis to Chet Atkins, and then obviously Tommy Emanuel is one of the modern players that really makes great use of the Travis picking style. Uh, let's go ahead and move to our next picking pattern or picking style that changed the guitar forever. And I wanna talk about flat picking. 
not just using a pick, but specifically flat picking fiddle tunes, kind of in the bluegrass or country realm. And this has an interesting lineage because I don't think we can necessarily tie it to one specific player, but rather trace it back to its early roots. Uh, some of the early adopters and innovators of this country and bluegrass flat picking style include George Shuffler, Alton Delmore, Johnny Bond, Don Reno, Bill Napier. And one of the funny things that I read as I was kind of researching the, the history of flat picking, if you will, is that at one point in time, the lead guitar was sparsely used. And I would attribute that probably to volume issues. You know, you've got a fiddle and a banjo. The acoustic guitar really can't compete with those louder instruments. But this is the thing that really kind of struck me. Sometimes lead guitar was considered a novelty. And I think it is certainly far from a novelty now in the way that we look at and approach bluegrass flat picking. Now let's just trace it back through its roots a little bit. I would say one of the early adopters of flat picking is indeed Riley Puckett. Riley Puckett had this really interesting style where he had these very strong bass leads and almost chord transitions that were bass led. And I think this really shows kind of the early roots of flat picking. From there, we can go to a, a plethora of flat pickers. I think one of the next ones, certainly in the lineage is Clarence White, who, who took acoustic guitar flat picking to new heights. And then of course, Doc Watson, and then Tony Rice, amongst many, many others. I mean, I feel like I often refer to the Mount Rushmore of flat picking guitarists. I think it's it's it should have more room than just four faces. Uh, you've got Norman Blake amongst many others, Dan Crary, I mean, the list goes on and on. But I feel like we're in an interesting time because we, we still continue to see flat picking guitar in the bluegrass realm being pushed to new boundaries, being raised to new heights. And there's this interesting time that we're all participating in right now in which kind of the, the I was gonna say the old guard, but that's not entirely true. I would say the the previous generation of flat pickers is kind of handing the torch to the new generation of flat pickers. And I found video evidence of this. Here is Brian Sutton playing with Billy Strings at I believe in, at Dell Fest in 2018. They're picking on the tune Freeborn Man and it is just face meltingly good. Let's have a listen. Such a cool exchange uh, for so many different reasons. You got Brian Sutton playing this old pre-war Martin D28. You've got Billy Strings playing his Thompson Dreadnought. I believe that one's got mahogany back and sides. Uh, but if you actually check out that full clip, there's a funny part at the beginning where Billy Strings is singing the opening lines to Freeborn Man. One of the lines is, I was born some 20 odd years ago. And he starts cracking up while singing that line, full well knowing that he's Definitely one of the younger flat pickers out there. Just a cool moment that I wanted to share with you all. The next picking style, the, the next picking pattern that I wanna share with you that I believe changed the face of the acoustic guitar really stems from flat picking itself, and that is cross picking. Cross picking is a style that really brings in the momentum of the banjo to the flat picked guitar world. It almost has this kind of harp like texture and it's it's very elegant, it can be very delicate, but it also can be incredibly powerful. Now this style originated or is said to be, uh, said to have originated with George Shuffler. And George Shuffler, developed the technique as kind of a fill-in, as, as, as a, both a backup style and a lead style while playing with the Stanley Brothers. Now, rather than me trying to tell the story of how George Shuffler came up with this technique, let's actually kick it over to George. George sat down with James Allen Shelton and uh, in an interview kind of, well, told the story of cross-picking as he knows it. Here it is. I uh, would like to ask you a, a question. How did you come up with the cross-picking style of guitar? What made you come up with that? particular way of playing a guitar. This sounds maybe a little bit funny, but it, it was out of necessity. Mm -hmm. Because most of the time, the, the group I was traveling with, the Stanley Brothers, 
And remember, it was back during the lean years of bluegrass. Mm -hmm. And we traveled, the three of us, and I tried every style. There wasn't many styles going back then. There wasn't anything to choose from. Right. Like they've got today, they can pick whoever they want to and pattern that. But they didn't have that then. And I think Merle Travis and uh, uh, Maybell Carter was the two besides some Western swing stuff that Bob Wills and them played, you know, right. on, the, on their electric guitars. And I found out that doing a cross picking, you feel it, you know, they sang a lot of slow songs, and at the end, when they'd stop and breathe and belch, <laughs> and so the fact that y'all didn't carry a full band, you had to fill in those spaces. I had to do those spaces. We didn't have a fiddle or a mandolin to step in to help do it, you know. It was it was George and then George and then George, <laughs> and so we, we had to come with something that would make it more f full, you know, make it fuller, and it, it seemed like it worked. Well, you, you start so cool for a couple of reasons. Number one, he actually cited two picking patterns that we've already mentioned, the Carter Scratch and, of course, Travis picking, but also the notion that at that time there wasn't really any styles going. You couldn't just pull up YouTube and try and emulate a style from another guitar player. You kind of had to, well, come up with it on your own. And now that you know the story behind cross picking, let's actually hear George Shuffler play, well, a little tune called Will You Miss Me? the close-up of the picking hand there and one of the things that I noticed uh, well two things really uh, George certainly adopted and, and, and built his cross picking style around that down down up approach in terms of, of pick direction uh, what I like to refer to as an odd cross picking style and then secondly the the pick that he uses seems rather thin which I thought was interesting because most flat pickers use a, a, a thicker pick and I thought this might have been attributed to maybe that just moves through the strings a little bit easier for him so he can maintain that, that uh, down, down, up pattern. But a very cool style nonetheless. All right, let's move on to uh, the final picking style on my list here. And this is really the most wide ranging style. Uh, tough to pick exactly one style, but I would say percussive finger style guitar is a picking pattern or an approach to the guitar that really changed the way that all of us consider uh, really how the acoustic guitar makes sound. Um, it really, percussive finger style took the guitar from one dimension and turned it into a three-dimensional instrument. I mean, you've got the percussive attacks, you've got the finger style approach, you've got the alternate tunings that are often used, and it really is amazing how many sounds can come out of one acoustic guitar. Now, this style, I would say, can be traced back to Michael Hedges, think Wyndham Hill Records, that type of era, where uh, this, this style was starting to become, well, it was starting to be shown to the public. I think we can trace a lot of the modern players back to Michael Hedges. The way that I found this percussive finger style approach was through Preston Reed, uh, my old boss at the Old Town School of Folk Music, Ted Parrish, who owns uh, Parrish Music in Viroqua, Wisconsin now, handed me this CD. It was Preston Reed, I believe it was instrument, Instrumental Landing or Instrument Landing. And he said, listen to this, it's really cool. And as soon as I turned it on, I was blown away by what I heard. I couldn't believe it was one acoustic guitar. And then of course, through tracing things back, found out about Michael Hedges. And now, you know, in today's, uh, in, in the modern day, there are so many different percussive fingerstyle guitar players. You've got Antoine DeFore, Adrian Ballou, uh, Andy McKee, amongst many, many others, Mike Dawes, uh, the list goes on and on. Eric Mongrain, uh, and each has their own unique approach, but I think we can we can safely say it falls under the umbrella of modern percussive finger style guitar. And I thought, what better what better way to celebrate this picking style and give you an idea of what it sounds like than to look at one of the newer players on the scene, Alexander Misko. And here he is playing his song, Cold Hands. <laughs>
again, I'm always amazed at how much sound can come out of a single guitar from a single player without any looping or anything like that. Now, as I was listing those players, one of the things, uh, something dawned on me that one of the, the, the featured artist today, who also happens to be an Acoustic Tuesday viewer, falls under this modern percussive fingerstyle guitar category. In fact, I think you're gonna be really excited to hear him uh, and know that he's part of our Acoustic Tuesday family. In fact, he's got his fingers in all sorts of areas of the acoustic guitar world, which I'll share just a little bit later. Um, but one of the things I wanna ask you, now that you know the five, and in case you want a quick review, we've got the Carter Scratch as a world-changing picking style, a guitar-changing picking style. We've got Travis picking. We've got flat picking. We've got cross picking. We've got the modern percussive finger style approach. What are the other styles that you think have changed the acoustic guitar, have changed the way you hear the acoustic guitar, have changed the way you personally approach the acoustic guitar? If you know of a style or you want to share a style that you think fits the bill, please do so in the comments below. All right, this week on Acoustic Tuesday, You've already learned five picking patterns that change the way we look at the acoustic guitar, really forever. <laughs> You're also gonna get the scoop about a luthier who lives super close to the studio here in Bozeman that I never heard of before, and he's making some incredible, incredible instruments. And as I mentioned, you're gonna hear some tunes from one of our very own Acoustic Tuesday viewers. And he certainly falls in that modern percussive finger style category. <laughs> Welcome to Acoustic Tuesday, episode number 147. This is the show where you're gonna learn about acoustic guitar gear, discover acoustic artists, and get inspired to live your very best acoustic life. As with all episodes of Acoustic Tuesday, I'm gonna share with you my guitar geek list for the week, but before we dive into that, there's an interesting cross-section of luthery and playing style that really makes up our guitar geek trivia question for the day. In fact, this deals with one of the picking styles I mentioned, and a pretty, well, I think, very famous luthier that you should know about. Here's your question. Which of the following luthiers has built guitars for John Denver, Michael Hedges, and Alex Degrassi? Is it A, Kevin Ryan, B, Michael Greenfield, C, Irvin Samoji, or D, James Olson? Go ahead and ponder that, and at the end of the show, I'll be sure to give you the answer with, of course, a little bit of a story, as I do favor story time quite frequently. All right, let's dive back into my Guitar Geek list for the week, and this has to do with the luthier that lives really close to the studio right here in Bozeman, Montana. In fact, this is a luthier whom I never really tied his name to Montana. I've seen his instruments in pictures and magazines and always thought, wow, those are strikingly gorgeous. Uh, talk about functional beauty, something that is just incredible to look at, but you hear it and you're like, wow, that beautiful instrument is making that beautiful sound. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about Gage Halland, who actually calls Livingston, Montana home. It's just 30 miles due east of us here in Bozeman. And Livingston, Montana is a beautiful town that's full of artists and creatives. And this is where Gage Halland builds guitars, striking guitars at that. In fact, uh, going on his website, I, I pulled a little bit of a quote that I wanna share with you because it, it really tells his story, who he studied with, and also, kind of his philosophy in building. So here's his story. As I started to build guitars, I quickly realized that in order to build at the level I desired, I would need to find mentors and educate myself as much as possible. I happened to reach out to legendary guitar builder, John Grevin, who allowed me to come ask questions and observe his process. Witnessing firsthand his expertise in guitar making, my eyes were opened to what an acoustic guitar is capable of. After completing an intensive six month guitar making course, I was offered an apprenticeship with Michael Greenfield in Montreal, Quebec. The dream apprenticeship. My wife and I sold everything we owned, packed up our two kids and moved to Montreal. The apprenticeship was a bespoke guitar making master course. The perfectionist nature of Greenfield guitars perfectly suited my obsessive, always make it better attitude. And I really feel as though I landed in the right atmosphere for that best two years of my life. We returned to Portland and I immediately got to work building out my shop and finalizing designs for the first Howling guitars. During my time in Montreal, I began to develop my own theories on acoustic sound production and some of the inherent deficiencies in certain elements of the acoustic guitar. I like to think that I am applying the best of what I learned under the tutelage of Michael Greenfield while steering the design and sound to what will be instantly recognizable as a Howland instrument. Now, 
Obviously, after this was written, uh, Gage and his family moved to Livingston, Montana, where now his shop currently is. And holy smokes, what a cool story, number one, studying under some of the best luthiers in the business. But you saw his guitars, and they are striking. And you're probably wondering, okay, they look great, but what the hell do they sound like? <laughs> Let's actually have a listen. One of his guitars made it down to Dream Guitars, which is a fantastic shop. I would strongly recommend you all check it out. Uh, if you just wanna drool all over your keyboard, that's that's the website you should go to. Dream, I believe it's dreamguitars.com. Stunning, stunning uh, uh, group of luthiers that have their instruments there. Gage is one of them, and they recently had a DCH model in that was a fan fret design. Beautiful guitar, European spruce top, along with African blackwood back and sides. The arm bevel and chest bevel that he uses on his guitars is striking. It's, I keep saying that because it is. It's really gorgeous. It doesn't go to a single point like most bevels do. It's kind of squared off and then very ele elegantly tied into the edge of the instrument. A gorgeous design, even more gorgeous sound. Let's go ahead and listen to the Halland DCH as played by the folks at Dream Guitars. <laughs> Wow, I mean, from the, the subtly asymmetrical headstock, which I think is unique and a tough thing to pull off, um, to have a classy headstock design that's different from all the others out there is, is I think, a feat in and of itself. So uh, kudos to that design, but also just looking at the bridge and the sound, it's just lush. It's dripping with overtones. Each, each string has plenty of space. Each string has this wonderful blossom to it, and the sustain is, is stunning as well. So uh, there you have it. Halland Guitars made by Gage Halland uh, right here in Livingston, Montana. To learn more about Gage and his instruments, please visit AcousticLife.tv forward slash AT147. Uh, you'll be able to uh, get a link to, to Gage's website. And once you're there, please check out the gallery. Uh, there's some fantastic pictures taken of, as I mentioned before, really some striking instruments. I'm going to try and not say striking anymore in the show. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> It's, it's a fitting word for his guitars. It really is. Um, so again, go to acousticlife.tv forward slash AT147 to learn more about Halland Guitars and follow him on Instagram as well. He's got a cool shop dog and posts some really great stuff that's in process. Uh, in fact, I want to say, I might be confusing luthiers, but I want to say he's got a Port Orford cedar top in process right now. Again, striking. <laughs> Let's hop in our time machine and go back to episode number 145 of Acoustic Tuesday, where we talked about using the mind to overcome physical limitations. Specifically, we looked at 10 artists who still create, still, still compose beautiful music despite physical limitations. And there were some great comments on there. Really, uh, the episode seemed to serve as a great inspiration for a lot of us guitar geeks. And I thought that was awesome. Our first comment comes from Heartbreaker Guitars, of course, part of the Acoustic Tuesday family. And Heartbreaker Guitars says this, Tony, this is a great episode. Most of us who complain about practicing sometimes are inspired by these players who overcame incredible obstacles just to play it all. Inspiring to say the least. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much, Brendan, Carly, and everybody at Heartbreaker Guitars. Uh, really uh, loving what they're posting lately. There's some really beautiful guitars they have in stock. But nonetheless, always cool to know that our very own Acoustic Family, Acoustic Tuesday family comes together to watch the show on Tuesdays. So very cool. Uh, our next comment comes from M. Gafke, if I'm saying that last name correctly. Tony, thank you for this one. I've been thinking fingerstyle guitar might not be in the cards for me. After today's show, I am hopeful. I lost the use of my right hand ring finger when I was a year old running in the house with a piece of glass in my hand and I fell on it. It's attached, but it mainly gets in the way. I found ways to work around it all my life. Your work is inspiring and I plan to keep trucking and leaning 
what I can on the TAC program. Thanks again. Well, thanks so much for watching and thanks for sharing your story. You know, one of the things that was interesting that came to light after that episode aired is there are so many members of our acoustic family, our Acoustic Tuesday viewing family that have some sort of physical limitations, whether it be you know missing a digit or uh, crippling arthritis or something along those lines. So it was really cool to see the outpouring of support, not only for the show, but the sharing of stories uh, that each of our very own fellow guitar geese has. So hopefully it did serve as an inspiration and it, it really did seem, seem like it, it served that purpose. Our next comment comes from Sue Gates. Wow. The last one you showed kind of smacked me upside my head. That's referring to Andre Godoy, uh, amazing, amazing fingerstyle guitar player who happens to play with one hand. He plays guitar with one hand, a, a, amazing player. Just started my fingerstyle journey, which is my biggest dream. I'm struggling a bit, but no doubt will remember what I just saw. Very inspirational. I myself have a challenge, not quite like those you showed, but my love of guitar music never stops me from learning every single day. Can't play every day, but will continue to climb up that mountain. Thanks. Well, thank you, Sue. I, I appreciate uh, you sharing your comment, your story, and of course, wishing you the best of luck on your guitar journey. Our next comment comes from Jay Schultz. He says, great show. I cut the end off my ring finger uh, behind the nail when I was about 12. The doc sewed it back on, but it's a quarter inch shorter than it should be. I started playing guitar at 48 and am now 55. Some chords are tough to play and some buzzing happens. I just call it jazz and then press on. <laughs> Great story, Jay. I'm so glad you picked up the guitar and are continuing with it. What a cool journey for you. And again, thank you for sharing your story. And again, I, I mentioned this, but I wanna thank everyone for all their comments. Uh, really a delight to not only read the stories, but share in some of the, uh, the excitement and joy for, well, each of your own individual guitar journeys. So I uh, definitely appreciate those comments on that episode and of course all the episodes. Um, quick little news update before we dive into some other Acoustic Tuesday viewer stuff. I've got a guitar snow coming up, a really cool guitar gratitude, and of course our artist of the week, who happens to be an Acoustic Tuesday viewer, who actually has submitted his guitar snow before as well. More on that in a bit. I just wanted to give you a quick little news update on some things, some happenings. Uh, first and foremost, I don't know if you've all been following Emerald Guitars. Emerald Guitars is a, a carbon fiber guitar company based in Ireland. And since things were kind of shut down and in a weird state of affairs, given uh, all the, the latest happenings with the pandemic and everything like that, Alistair, the owner of Emerald Guitars, started a new project. He started designing a Weissenborn guitar out of carbon fiber. And each day he's been posting progress, which is cool to see. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's always cool to see something new being created. But secondly, he's giving you the inside scoop on how a carbon fiber instrument goes from idea to actual physical instrument. And he's taking you through step by step. So if you haven't caught this yet, and you've always been curious as to how carbon fiber instruments are made, uh, this is a great peek behind the curtain. And it's really a fun watch. Each video is roughly 10 minutes long and really goes through each step of the process from ideation to execution. Now, along with that and this Weissenborn project, he just announced that they're actually giving one away. And I'm gonna share with you how to enter this, but here's a quick little message from Emerald Guitars, Alistair specifically, on the project and of course the, uh, the giveaway. I'll give you the details here in a second, but go ahead and take it away, Alistair. We're almost ready to actually start and build the instrument. Um, I'll be coming back to you with some questions about ideas of how we're going to build that first instrument, the, the type of veneer we're going to use, uh, colors, that sort of thing. And uh, it's been a fantastic collaborative process. You know, everybody's been sending me ideas and your thoughts on it, and uh, and that's been really cool. Uh, we've loved the videos that you've sent in. Thanks for everybody that's, that's sending in videos. Uh, so really remember that competition. Um, somebody is going to win a wise and born guitar uh, by Emerald Guitars whenever it's completed. So uh, the way to win that, or the way to enter, is to send us in a video of a performance, not just on a Weissenborn style guitar, but any slide type guitar. And uh, it's been fascinating just to see different styles, different approaches to it, and we've enjoyed it, including those into our, our daily videos. So. Uh 
So you heard it from Alistair, they're actually giving a wise and porn away and all you have to do to enter this competition is email a video of you playing lap style guitar, slide guitar of some sort. This could be on a lap steel, it could be on a Weissenborn, it could be on a standard six string guitar with one of those extension nuts that allows you to play lap style with a slide. But nonetheless, film yourself playing slide lap style guitar and send it to sales at emeraldguitars.com. Sales at emeraldguitars.com and you'll be entered to win one of their first carbon fiber Weissenborns. A really cool opportunity that I want each and every one of you guitar geeks to try and take advantage of if you can. Now, a little second piece of news. I had a chance to actually sit down with Alistair last week or two weeks ago and interview him about the Weisenborn project, kind of life in carbon fiber guitars. And uh, wow, he just, it was such a fun and entertaining conversation. Uh, we'll be posting that here in the coming weeks, but I just wanted to give you the, the sneak peek on that. And what an enjoyable conversation, really. Uh, uh, Talk about an individual who's so passionate about what he does. Uh, and I learned so much about carbon fiber in this in this discussion. It was it was truly a, a treat. So we'll be posting that here in the future. Also, speaking of Guitar Geek Talks, uh, just again, a couple of weeks ago, I had a chance to sit down with Michael Watts from the UK. Fantastic fingerstyle guitar player. Definitely an acoustic guitar uh, personality. And... Um, we had a wonderful discussion. I was gonna call it an interview, but it was really just a, a live Instagram discussion about guitar, our experiences. Uh, some folks wrote in questions. In fact, we got questions from uh, John Stubbings, the author of The Devil Is In It, and he asked a wonderful question. Uh, and to check out that full, I'll call it an interview or discussion, uh, a very special acoustic chat, I believe is what Michael's calling it. Uh, please visit Instagram. You'll be able to find that on Michael's page as well as the TAC guitar page. And if you're not following us on Instagram, please do. Uh, just go to Instagram and search for at tac.guitar and you'll be able to see all the fun things that we post there. Uh, between me just noodling at home, some really great coaching tips, uh, some of your fellow acoustic guitar geeks living their best acoustic life as well. And speaking of those fellow guitar geeks, one more thing. I got this in the mailbag and I thought it was absolutely fantastic. This is from the Gulf Coast Guitar Geeks. This is a TAC Jam Club. And Ricky K sent this. He said, Tony, here's a little something from the Houston Guitar Geeks. Guitar Geeks Unite. Uh, so I want to thank Ricky K and all the folks in that uh, jam club for sending me this awesome coffee mug. It's got a little star where they're located at. Little guitars. I mean, it doesn't get much better than this. Coffee and guitars. It just goes straight to my heart. All right, moving right along. Speaking of guitars and going straight to my heart, let's have a look at one of our very own Acoustic Tuesday viewers' guitar signals. This one comes from Pipersville, Pennsylvania. It is from David J. And he says this about his guitar signal. Hey, Tony, first want to thank you for everything you do. Before discovering TAC a year ago, I was an on again, off again with the guitar, but now I play practically every day and I'm having a great time with it. Also have to send big thanks to Sharon and Dom for hosting the guitar jams for the Friends with Strings Jam Club. What an awesome group of people. Now for the collection, right to left. We've got a Paul Reed Smith SE Soap Bar 2, a Gibson Les Paul. Yes, I still enjoy playing the electrics and love both of these. I've got an Ovation. 1117-1, I've had this forever and it still sounds good, great for campfires. A little Martin, always ready for a road trip. To my right, a Martin DCME, they don't make it anymore, but it is still awesome. And in my hands is my Gibson J45 that I bought new in January, thanks to AT, Acoustic Tuesday episode number 120. I've hardly put it down since it arrived. Thanks again and Guitar Geeks Unite. Well, David, thank you for submitting your guitar signal. And you're gonna be very happy about a future Acoustic Tuesday episode that I'm about to announce here at the end of the show. In fact, it's gonna be a versus episode. Uh, judging by the success and the discussion that was created from the Martin versus Taylor episode, we decided we'll do another versus episode. I'll, I'll tell you exactly who is being pitted against one another here a little bit later, but uh, David, I think, you'll be, I think you'll be very, very pleasantly surprised. Again, thanks, David, for submitting your guitar signal. If you want to submit a guitar signal, it's super easy. Visit AcousticTuesday.store, and then go ahead and pick out the guitar signal shirt. Get it shipped directly to your door. Once you receive it, put it on, take a picture amongst all of your guitars, and then submit your picture at AcousticLife.tv. There's a submit link in the top menu. Click on it. You can upload your picture and, of course, tell your story, and I'll feature you on an 
upcoming episode of Acoustic Tuesday. I do see the submissions rolling in, which is so nice to see. Uh, so let's keep that momentum going. And uh, like I said, I'll feature your guitar arsenal on a future episode. And uh, speaking of guitars, viewers, our Guitar Geek family, something we should all be grateful for, of course. I've got a wonderful new guitar gratitude from Acoustic Tuesday vis vi uh, visitor, Acoustic Tuesday viewer, Rawia. And uh, she's got two very distinct pieces of wisdom contained in here. I'll get to those in a second, but first, take it away, Rawia. I'm so grateful for my guitar and for learning how to play with Tony Polcastro because on a day when my son was crying or holding a tantrum, I was in my room playing and I started to create a song for him. It calmed my nerves and it actually put him to sleep. I also am grateful for uh, the process that Tony has taught us of 10 minutes per day because it's translated into so many other creative uh, ventures in my life that I had originally put off and now just play or draw or dance for 10 minutes a day, including exercising for 10 minutes a day. And it's um, transformed my life. It's also transformed the way I view um, being professional in life. Thank you. Very grateful. All right. Thank you so much, Rawia, for submitting your guitar gratitude. And the two pieces of wisdom that really stuck out to me is number one, uh, the calming nature of the guitar, which I think all of us guitar geeks have experienced at least one time in our guitar journeys. And then the second thing that she mentioned is the power of 10 minutes a day. Now, whether, whether or not, um, you stick to the 10 minutes a day. Sometimes practice sessions can go well beyond 10 minutes a day. I think her explaining the power of 10 minutes a day and just kind of getting the ball rolling really tie, kind of kind of wraps up in a nice little bow how truly impactful integrating that philosophy into your guitar journey is. So again, thank you so much, Rawia, for submitting your guitar gratitude. And if, if you're sitting there as a grateful guitar geek and you think, I want to share my guitar gratitude, uh, please do so. Go to guitargratitude.com. It actually takes 60 seconds or less. Once you go to that website, you'll be prompted to click the record button. Right there, you can submit your video and just explain why you're grateful for your guitar. Maybe it's brought something into your life that you never saw coming, friends, relationships, uh, situations, or maybe it just simply offers you peace of mind like Rawia. So uh, again, go visit guitargratitude.com to submit your guitar gratitude today. Moving on to our Artist of the Week. And I am so excited about this because our Artist of the Week not only is an Acoustic Tuesday viewer, he is an Acoustic Tuesday participant. In fact, he submitted his guitar arsenal. We'll get to that in a second. But our featured artist for the day is Sean DeBurka. And I'm so excited to share his music with you. If you have not heard it yet, you are in for a treat. I feel like Sean and I are, well, I feel like we're brothers from another mother. Uh, between the long hair, the beard, our love for metal music and our love for the acoustic guitar, not to mention he's a full-blown guitar geek. As I mentioned, he submitted his guitar arsenal, uh, which I think is like the pinnacle of Guitar Geek Mountain. Uh, there he is with a bunch of different lefty guitars. As you can see, he's got his Dean, uh, I believe that's a dime bag model along with some other Faith guitars. He's got a custom seven string and I can't remember the maker, uh, but it's a beautiful sounding guitar and you're actually gonna hear it here in a moment. Uh, Sean has this wonderful knack, this wonderful uncanny superpower of combining the power of heavy metal music and the elegance and the, the delicateness of the acoustic guitar. And he makes them come together in this beautiful synergy. And I listen to his, his music and I'm just, I am just taken away because he he really does toe the line between that drive of metal and that that beautiful subtlety of the acoustic guitar. So it's just so you know what I'm talking about, let's go ahead and listen to some of his tunes. This is off of his latest release, Shapeshifter, and it is a song by the same exact name. Here's Shapeshifter off of Sean's new album. <laughs> Thank you. 
amazing guitarist to watch play. It's one thing to listen to it. It's the other thing to actually see him play it. And I, you know, we were rehearsing for the show today and I looked at Colorado Kyle and I said, how the hell does he do all that at once? I've tried and attempted some percussive stuff and everything falls apart. But there he's got the feet going on the effects. He's got the fretting hand moving. He's got the picking hand moving. And I'm like, wow, he's like a he's like a master juggler. Uh, and uh, as I you know, the result is is tremendous. I, I might have mentioned this before, but if I didn't, Sean also has his his fingers in all sorts of realms of the acoustic guitar world. I'll explain what I mean here in a second, but let's go ahead and listen to another tune. This is a tune called Kuiper Belt, again off of his new Shapeshifter album. <laughs> Sean calls Kent England home, and while he's not playing the guitar, he has an interesting, well, other life. He's a self-professed uh, drummer turned guitarist. That's obvious from listening to him play, but he also does some incredible graphic design. In fact, he's designed Antoine DeFore's album. He, he did the art for that, his newest one, uh, Back and Forth. He's designed the artwork for Adrian Ballou's newest album, String Slinger, the Adrian Ballou project, as well as some other graphics that uh, I just saw on Adrian's site, some shirt designs and things like that. He did the cover for the Acoustic, Upri uh, the Acoustic Uprising uh, documentary that I recommended in previous shows. He's obviously done his own <laughs> art for his own albums, and... Um, what an what the, he's an ultimate guitar geek. He's got like I said, he's got his fingers kind of in all the areas of guitar geekism, and uh, I'm so delighted because he seems to be just one of those people that whatever he decides to do, he's really good at. Uh, whether it be graphic design, art, playing guitar, or just being a genuine awesome human being and, and stellar guitar geek. Uh, so that being said, let's go ahead and listen to one more clip uh, of of Sean play. And this was from a previous album. This, this clip you're about to hear is the song, The Road So Far. It's not on his new album, but it really, to me, shows the versatility of his approach to the acoustic guitar. Let's go ahead and have a listen. So that song that you just heard, to the best of my recollection, is off of Sean's Mechanism album. Now, speaking of albums, let me give you the rundown of what Sean has released into the world so far uh, for you to do some further listening. Uh, first up, uh, the most recently released album, Shapeshifter. This was done, uh, this was actually let go into the world on June 1st, 2020. It's a delight of an album to listen to. I think I'm on my my 10th lap of this album. It's a double disc and it's it's got a really cool concept behind it because it starts out very acoustic on the first disc and then the second disc is a little bit more effects driven and a drummer and percussionist are introduced. But the cool thing is, is you're gonna listen to the same songs in two different formats. So the first disc, as I mentioned, has kind of got the, the delicateness of the acoustic guitar with some subtle effects. But as you move to the second disc, it's a little bit more effects driven, as I mentioned with the integration of a percussionist, and drummer, and uh, a little bit more layering of effects on the acoustic guitar. It's really cool to get two different perspectives on the same exact songs. Uh, so that's, that's an album that I would encourage you to take the journey. 
literally start on track one and listen to it from track one to the end because it is it is very fruitful. Each time I listen, I discover something new. Now, released prior to that was the album Mechanism. Again, another beautiful album full of Sean's original compositions. And then prior to that is the album Storm Chaser. Now, all of these albums you can get on Spotify. I would strongly recommend listening to them there. And if you want a physical copy, you can go ahead and reach out to Sean. I'm sure he'd be very happy to not only hear from you, but send you a physical copy as well. Now, to learn more about Sean, see those uh, those performances in their entirety, please visit AcousticLife.tv forward slash AT147. And uh, I think you'll be excited to see those performances. They're, they're, as I mentioned, it's tough. It was tough for me to even pick just a tiny chunk because there's so many, it's almost like an orchestral movement. Like you don't get the full scope of the song. You get just a little taste. So again, please go to AcousticLife.tv forward slash AT147 and you'll be able to uh, learn a lot more about Sean and see those pieces in their entirety, which I encourage you to digest them that way. All right, we're about ready to wrap up the show, but we've got to revisit your Guitar Geek trivia question. And just in case you forgot what it was, it was a question based on the cross-section of Luthery and some of the picking patterns we discussed earlier. Here's the question. Which of the following Luthiers has built guitars for John Denver, Michael Hedges, and Alex Degrassi? Was it A, Kevin Ryan, B, Michael Greenfield, C, Irvin Samoji, or D, James Olson? If you guessed C, Irvin Samoji, you are correct. Born in Budapest, Hungary, Irvin Samoji fled Europe with his family during World War II after living in Austria, England, Cuba, and Mexico. He eventually moved to the United States at age 15. After graduating from UC Berkeley with a degree in English, he joined the Peace Corps, worked in a mental hospital, attended graduate school, and supported himself as a flamenco guitarist, but he eventually gravitated back to the East Bay, which has been his home since about 1972. Building guitars started out as a hobby. At first, Samoji had little hope of making a living at it, he says. With few how-to books available or schools where he could take classes, he learned primarily by getting his hands on some well-made instruments and studying them. It was a very oddball activity, he says. Now, as one of the grand old men of American Luthery, Samoji is often invited to lecture at guitar shows and exhibitions. He builds primarily high-end steel string guitars that sell for over $30,000 each. Samoji cultivates a clientele of serious musicians, such as the late John Denver and Michael Hedges, and fingerstyle master Alex Degrassi. He creates exactly one handmade steel string acoustic guitar per month, 12 annually. He does not take vacations. Since starting, he's, he's created more than 456 guitars uh, since the early 70s. He, was he has written two volumes on Luthery, uh, The Responsive Guitar and The Making of the Responsive Guitar, as well as Voicing the Guitar, which was a DVD produced at the Healdsburg Guitar Festival in 2009. A pretty stunning guitar maker. And if you look at some of his instruments, some of them are just just drop your jaw gorgeous. I mean, blow your socks clear off your feet. Um, and just kind of getting to know more of him, some of the luthiers that have apprenticed under him, uh, Jason Costell is one that rings a bell. I believe Tom Sands has also apprenticed under Irvin. And uh, wow, uh, stunning results. He, he certainly has a, a pretty awesome philosophy when it comes to building. And I think it shows not only with the clientele, but also in some of the students that have actually uh, learned from him. Uh, so definitely somebody you need to know in the acoustic guitar world. Well, that pretty much wraps up the show for this week, but I've got a little sneak peek into next week that I wish to offer you. Come, come. I invite you to come look into the crystal ball with me, or in this case, I'll be reading uh, my coffee out of my John Boy Media mug. Uh, and uh, I'm going to see if I can predict the future. Oh, yes, I see. Uh, next week on Acoustic Tuesday, I have to go between my notes and my coffee reading to make sure they align. Uh, next week on Acoustic Tuesday, you asked for it and you're going to get it. Another epic battle between two huge U.S. guitar makers. Yes, this is, uh, this is the gloves are off and these two are going to go at it. Round after round, we're going to pit Martin versus Gibson this time next week on Acoustic Tuesday. You're not going to want to miss you're not going to want to miss this showdown. It is going to be one for the ages. So, please tune in to Acoustic Tuesday next Tuesday and of course all Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Mountain Time here on YouTube and of course for your Acoustic Tuesday fix, please visit acousticlife.tv where you can do a deep dive on anything I've ever featured on the Acoustic Tuesday show. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me today. Thank you so much for being a guitar geek and thank you so much for just being 
a good human being. Uh, cheers to you. Make sure to know and remind yourself frequently, Guitar Geeks Unite. I'll see you next Tuesday. Take care. Thank you.